Hello viewers, I welcome you to yet another lecture on population studies and management. In the last lecture, we discussed about the challenges that the higher education faced in India and solutions offered by various government and non-government agencies in India. In this lecture, we will discuss the higher education in India from the perspective of the private sector and the students. The view from the private sector. The private colleges felt the lack of freedom under the affiliation system, which denies them degree awarding powers and gives them no control over curriculum and courses they offer. Many private universities and large private colleges are keen to develop their research capacity through international partnerships, but most are starting afresh. Apart from few well-established private universities, they do not have any experience in research and very few international contacts. However, they believe that their strong industry connections give them an advantage over public universities and that the increasing interest in technology transfer and employability will attract international collaborations. Several institutions were looking to diversify their courses away from engineering, believing that the market is close to saturation. Kumar Guru College of Technology in Coimbatore, for example, is planning to expand its course offerings into finance, arts, humanities and educational management and to establish themselves in the courses not currently being offered elsewhere, for example, in traditional architecture and heritage engineering. Although it is not clear how widespread this is amongst private institutions, it appears to contradict the views of some public universities that private institutions would further reduce diversity in course offerings. The 12th five-year plan for higher education also specifically aims to broaden course choice in the future. Although it is not clear how this will happen. Some private universities see a future in opening branch campuses outside India, mainly for Indian students, where regulations are more favorable. This has already started happening. Amita University, for instance, has several overseas campuses, including one in London. Private colleges and universities have a desire to collaborate and for the bigger, well-financed institutions, enthusiasm to grow their reputation through international partnerships. Significant changes in student profile and segmentation. Several institutions express the need for institutions to address socio-demographic changes, which many believed would have a profound effect on education in the coming decade in India. In some cases, for example, in Tamil Nadu, up to 30% of new entrants to higher education are first generation learners. This presents specific demands and challenges to institutions, which in the past have been geared to servicing an urban elite. Changing demographics are also affecting the demand for degree subjects. The rapid growth in student enrollment from rural areas and from urban females is resulting in more demand for science subjects which India needs, while urban males are moving towards professional and business-oriented courses. The Indian Institute of Chemical Biology reported that generation who are now professors or senior lecturers come from elites who emerge from immediate post-independence era. In marked contrast, 60% of their students currently studying sciences come from rural communities. These new entrants have a particular learning needs particularly proficiency in English. The changing demands of different market segments will have particularly strong impact on the growth of private sector, which currently almost exclusively offers professional courses. The desire for international collaboration or discourse around these issues did not arise. However, there is undoubtedly a role for the social sciences in understanding and managing the impact of these demographic changes not only on education system, but also across society. Future debate and leadership in Indian higher education. There is a need to stimulate discussion among academics rather than policy makers. The Rashtri Uchitar Shiksha Abhiyan reforms currently underway specifically require the development of formal leadership functions and strategic management at both the state and institution levels. 
Given the range of critical issues facing Indian higher education and broadly speaking, a need for strategic solutions to these problems, leadership is clearly an area which requires further investigation. Teaching and learning, teacher development. The primary concern for all institutions was the poor quality of teaching in higher education across all levels of the study, particularly at undergraduate level. It was recognized that poor learning outcomes in many Indian institutions had at its roots the following interrelated issues, lack of teaching skills in the faculty and limited understanding of the learning process, the use of outdated pedagogies, input-oriented lecture-based approaches rather than student-centered, inquiry-driven and outcome-based, outdated and inflexible curricula, a rigid assessment system which encourages rote learning and does not test students' broader skills or deeper learning. Lack of an effective quality assurance system for teaching and learning. There is no effective institutional mechanism to support teaching faculty development. There was broad agreement that academic staff colleges set up under previous five-year plans have not worked as intended. Under the 12th five-year plan, the government would like to encourage institutions to set up their own teaching and learning centers to improve teaching quality. The role of the teacher needed to change from information providers to learning facilitators. This required a switch of focus from content teaching to learning outcomes. It was thought that very few teachers are professionally equipped for this transition. Looking a decade ahead, Several institutions predict a much younger and larger faculty as the drive to rapidly expand higher education provision accelerates. If this is reflected more widely across the system, and this is indeed part of the government's 12th plan, institutions will find themselves with a large, young faculty inexperienced in research and teaching. There has been a huge growth of private coaching not only in higher education, but across the education sector as a whole. In West Bengal, for instance, it is estimated that 80% of the students take private coaching lessons alongside their regular classes, often delivered by the same university teachers. It was felt this was ultimately destructive, discouraging teachers from covering subjects adequately in class in order to protect their private tutoring business. Future institutional reforms in teaching will have to tackle this problem. Another present and future challenge cited by several institutions concerning the new system of employing short-term teachers in universities. Salaries are very low, 10,000 rupees a month approximately, only a quarter the rate paid to teachers in permanent positions. This situation did not bode well with the future. It was not only exploitative, but would also result in high turnover, undermining efforts to enhance quality. An Indian revolution in digital learning technologies. It is predicted that digital learning technologies will transform higher education in the coming decade, and some believe this would occur in the next two to three years. All indicated that international collaboration was urgently needed in this emerging area. The importance of educational technologies for higher education existed for two reasons. A. To meet the expanding future student demand and B. To enhance the quality of teaching and learning. Most saw future educational technologies having most impact through blended approaches, that is, a mix of face-to-face -face classroom teaching enhanced by technology-enabled learning. A smaller number foresaw a strong growth in fully distance education, degrees and modules, which would probably be provided by a smaller number of Indian institutions, although there was skepticism around the appropriateness of digital learning, teaching for disciplines which required lab skills and hands-on learning. The development of open educational resources, OERs, and bespoke interactive courses will be very important for India. There was low quality of the digital content and poor learning outcomes on current distance education courses, despite pockets of innovation and good practice. There is a dearth of good educational content being developed in India, 
most felt that this required a global effort and that international collaboration was needed in instructional design to produce high quality content which can be contextualized for the use in India. Most teachers are untrained in the use of technology and also in basic pedagogical methods and skills. There were concerns that it would take a long time for teachers to cope with the flipped classroom model whereby content is learned outside the classroom and class time used for higher level understanding and skill development. Without capacity building, even the best digital materials would not lead to improving learning outcomes. In higher education, connectivity and internet accessibility could not be barriers for much longer. The government rollout of the Akash tablet to be made available to all university students with the university acting as a Wi-Fi hub is expected to provide a platform for online learning. The state governments are also becoming active in this area. The Tamil Nadu government, amongst others, has provided laptop computers produced by Tata at only 2,000 rupees per student. It was predicted that access to technology and the internet will accelerate quickly in urban India, but will take longer to reach rural areas. Massive online open courses, that is MOOCs, on the whole were regarded as potentially transformational for India because they are affordable for all. At several campuses visited, a surprising number of students were taking MOOC courses, edX and Coursera alongside their degrees, although exact figures were hard to come by. Academics recognized the potential for the students to have access to some of the best teaching in the world and the opportunity to offer courses to professionals already in the workplace, but at the same time foresaw the pressure this would place on Indian teachers. It is doubted that fully digital courses would be accepted in the market in the short to medium term. In general, distance qualifications in India are considered second rate by students, parents and employers. Lifelong learning and skills. A changing market for higher education in India. Higher education institutions are starting to adapt and respond to professionals already in employment, mature learners and the demand from enrolled students for skills for employability. This is leading universities into the skills market. Many have recently started to offer short courses and flexible modes of study. It is possible that many more higher education institutes across the country are beginning to engage in the skills sector. There was need of integrating vocational education and higher education through a national qualifications framework which would enable easier mobility and access to study for students in both directions. Students and early stage researchers, future priorities. Institutes needed to transform themselves to better serve the needs of the students. Three key areas emerge. Provide students and early stage researchers with experience of research and development of research skills early on in their careers. Enable students to have international experiences during their studies at undergraduate and postgraduate levels to provide them with a globally relevant education. Develop an open, wider world view and ensure they are able to compete in an international market. Provide all students with skills related to employability and job creation including entrepreneurship and enterprise skills. Early stage research experience. There was widespread concern that undergraduates, PhD students and postdoctoral researchers are not being exposed to research early enough in their careers. This was considered one of the key reasons for the general low quality of research in Indian institutions and the chronic shortage of undergraduates and postgraduates choosing to pursue academic careers. There was a bleak future ahead for Indian higher education unless this was reversed. India's academia is drastically understaffed with 30 to 40 percent of the teaching posts vacant. Moreover, PhD output in India is seriously lagging behind all the other BRIC countries. India produces less than half the number of PhDs as China. There was concern that without the best minds of the next generation entering the academy, India would not be able to increase the quality of its research, nor successfully compete in research and innovation in the global marketplace. The IISERs 
were felt to be doing an excellent job in developing early stage research skills, but were producing small numbers of good researchers for their own institutions. The small scale of the initiative relative to the size of the problem meant that the benefits were unlikely to percolate through the system. Skill areas mentioned included English for researchers, proposal or bid writing, creative approaches to problem solving, critical analysis, collaborative and intercultural working including in virtual teams, learner training and information sourcing and management, bilateral exchanges. There was little interest in one-way exchanges from India to foreign countries, but there was forum mechanism to allow foreign students to come to India. The Indian Institutes of Science, Education and Research, the IISERs, are reported to have generous funding and are looking for innovative ideas and collaborations, which bring students and early stage researchers together. Several institutions saw future university classrooms linked internationally through learning partnerships with universities in other countries, facilitated by technology, not as one-off activity, but as a fully integrated and regular feature of the student experience. There was a need for workshops and seminars to be delivered in India by foreign academics, skilled in communicating science issues, challenges and theories in ways which motivate and excite young researchers. Skills for employability. Many Indian universities and colleges were performing poorly in preparing students for employment. Engineering colleges are particularly affected by low graduate employment and an oversaturated market. Only 10% of the 3 lakh annual engineering graduates from Tamil Nadu's colleges are employable and reported that 1000 people in engineering degrees recently applied for a vacancy as a rail track clearer for Indian Railways, which only required a grade 8 education. Other professional programs, particularly MBAs, were felt to be losing traction in the job market, except those from the top tier institutions due to saturation and low levels of job ready skills in graduates. Skills needed for the future include analytical thinking, problem solving, critical reasoning, collaborative working, innovation, creativity and ICT skills. English was considered essential. Three main challenges to providing these skills were teaching. There is very little awareness of the importance of these skills and little capacity to teach them. There are virtually no opportunities for collaborative working, creativity or real life problem solving. Assessment is based on rote learning and regurgitation of information. Teachers therefore teach to the exam and students learning is often narrow and theoretical. Lack of employer engagement or consultation by institutions was resulting in out of date curricula and a lack of awareness of the skills needed by industry. Entrepreneurship in enterprise education. A growing awareness was there amongst leaders and senior managers of the importance of entrepreneurship and enterprise education for future employability and job creation. There were indications that states may be interested in funding initiatives which develop the entrepreneurial skills of students as an integral part of the studies. IIM Ahmedabad has started to see a tangible shift in attitude and an increase in the entrepreneurialism in their graduates. Five years ago, only five out of 500 graduates would take up non-conventional careers. Now, at least 100, that is 20% do so by starting their own businesses or entering radically different forms of employment, despite being offered well-paid jobs in the management sector. This shift may also be a consequence, as previously mentioned, of the greater financial stability and therefore more appetite for risk taking of the upper middle classes. The same trend may not be seen in the emerging lower middle classes. Conclusion The higher education in India is a system undergoing considerable transformation. There is a sense of urgency in the policy makers, institution leaders and faculty to expand the system at a fast enough pace to meet the surge in demand while increasing quality and ensuring equitable access. There is a great deal of caution about the way reforms will unfold progress is likely to follow an unpredictable course.
the federal government is enabling states and institutions more autonomy to drive through reforms which is creating greater potential for international engagement. Indian institutions are seeking more international collaboration on their terms which will address their challenges. These reforms and the needs of the higher education sector have implications for future collaboration with Indian higher education. The extensive reforms in higher education in India reveal a system undergoing considerable transformation. Systemic reform in legislative environment. There are opportunities for strategic engagement and capacity building in higher education leadership and management at the state level in preparation for the implementation of the new regulatory system under the Rashtriya Uchitar Shiksha Abhiyan reform program. The central government will continue to support top tier centrally funded institutions. The largest funding opportunities for joint research is likely to remain with these institutions in the coming decade. However, they represent only a small fraction of the sector. Considerable opportunities exist for engagement with the vast and underserved state and private sectors which educate the majority of Indian students. The new performance related funding mechanisms for state universities are likely to open up opportunities for international collaboration. International experience and learning opportunities for students, faculty and early stage researchers are a top priority for Indian institutions. Institutions in India want partners which will send students and faculty to India. Extensive capacity building needs exist for early stage researchers and expertise in research skills, communication including English for researchers and a broad range of transferable skills. Huge potential exists in digital learning technologies, online and blended learning, instructional design, teacher development, management and support systems. The need to enhance the employability of graduates is presenting entry points. Thank you viewers for watching the lecture.